Well, Dan, you want to kick us off here? Well, hello, everyone. I'm Dan Sperling. I'm director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis, and I'm going to be moderating this session today. I'm also a co-author of the policy brief that you're going to be hearing about. So this is a really important topic, and it's the topic is the role of policy in steering autonomous automated vehicles toward the public interest. Now, so today we're going to focus only on light duty vehicles. Now, many of you might think we're, you know, way out front worrying about policy for AVs. And we're here to disagree with you on that, if you think that. And it's because policy will and actually already is playing a central role in developing and directing the technology and the business models of AVs. And to put it bluntly, AVs could follow a path that provides huge societal benefits in terms of ex expanding accessibility for many people and improving the efficiency of our transportation system. Or it could do just the opposite. And meaning it could benefit, it would certainly provide a lot of benefit, but it would be at the other extreme to more affluent elite travelers to have the resources to buy these more expensive new vehicles and personally own. But by doing that, there will also it will also be undermining efforts to make transportation in our cities more environmentally and economically sustainable. So there's a lot at stake here. And, and so we, we are going to argue, I will emphasize that policy needs to get out front if we want to guide the future of AVs to a better future. So um, we've got a great group of, uh, we've got two great speakers who were uh, authors of the brief. Molly D'Agostino was the principal author and Susan Shaheen, and then we have two panelists. But first, let me, before actually introducing him, let, let me just introduce Molly. Uh, and she's gonna give you some uh, additional overview and introduction and some instructions. So Molly leads our Three Revolutions Policy Initiative at UC Davis in both the Institute of Transportation Studies and our Policy Institute, and has been doing this, has been leading our efforts in this area for five years. You know, in that role, she leads our uh, the organization and hosting of our Three Revolutions Policy Conference, uh, legislative briefings that we do, and a lot of other outreach activities and events, as well as leading in the publication and writing of policy briefs and issue papers, like the one we're going to be discussing right now. And as I said, she was the lead principal author of that policy brief. So, Molly? Thank you so much, Dan. Um, yeah, and um, um, you know we had a team effort for this paper, so thank you so much for Dan and for Susan's role in, in shaping this paper, as well as one of our, um, our, our, our graduate student researchers, Darrell Francisco. So thank you, Darrell, as well. Um, so wanted to also give a little housekeeping, just make sure to keep any questions you have in the Q&A box and any technical questions can go in the chat but everyone is well Zoom trained these days, uh, so it shouldn't be an issue. Um, I'm going to go into um, share screen mode, so just bear with me while I get that going. Excuse me. Okay. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, so, we have a number of, um, you know, I think that, you know, as Dan said, I think that the, the reality is that this, um, this moment for transportation and for automation is um, an important one um, because, you know, for, for many reasons. Um, can you see my screen now? Okay, sorry, I was having a little moment there. Um, so, okay, so the, I would say the, um, the, the hype curve that has, has been discussed a lot is something to mention. You know, in 2016, when we started this conversation around the three revolutions, it was revolutionary. We were at the front of this hype curve. We had expectations that really, um, you know, were, 
were great and really just building. Um, and in 2019, this, uh, this Gardner uh, analysis showed that the hype curve had crested. And it, even in 2019, we were already over the, the peak of excitement about automated driving. Um, and right now, we may be in the trough of disillusionment, or we may be in the slope of enlightenment. Um, I'm sure people have different um, theories about that. But I think we're really right on the plateau, right on the precipice of the plateau of productivity. Of course, these, you know, these terms are, are a bit silly. But um, I think that what, what's important to recognize there is that the, um, you know, the, oopsie, um, the, moment we're in right now is where the, there are actual full deployments happening on the ground. There are thousands of, of driven miles in our state. Um, now we'll see commercial deployment from three companies, Muro, Cruise, and Waymo. I'm under the uh, impression that Waymo has launched aggressively in San Francisco. I was just told this morning, and thank you for, for giving me that information, Bert, one of our other speakers. Um, so we're, we're seeing these vehicles now. So this is not the moment to sort of look away or think, oh, we already talked about automated vehicles five years ago. We, we can ignore them now. We've solved that problem, right? We have not solved AVs. We have, we have done very little, um, in fact. And these are some of the problems, both unknown and known problems, we associate with um, AVs. I'll say that this, this project, this effort, was associated with the CSAC, was associated with the Strategic Growth Council. And um, the Strategic Growth Council tasked us with considering strategies to address the three revolutions in California. And so that's where we came at this. So first we developed a set of problems. We think we are still uh, problems that face AVs, um, face the state as a result of, the, of, of AVs. And these problems are not comprehensive. Like Dan said, we narrowly focused on light duty vehicles um, to some extent. And, um, you know, we, we, but we think these problems are worth recognizing. So out of date safety regulatory regimes, um, automated, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, people really aren't comfortable with talking about workforce issues and the conversation has been somewhat stifled. Um, mobility justice issues, BMT and transportation emissions, I would argue um, among our team, those are the issues that we've been addressing the most, but certainly that's not necessarily the case in the policy um, realm. And I think the largest question, the largest problem that we that I, that we identified was that automated vehicles are new, and people aren't just aren't clear on how to regulate them, how to how to talk about them, and how to even think about them. And so I think those problems together are some of our, our the, the challenges we we sought to tackle with this project. Um, and we just asked one simple key research question: What policies can fill gaps in existing state policy and advance safety, equity, accessibility, and sustainability priorities? Um, so those that was our that's key research question. What I'm going to do is pause there, and I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, the the great Susan Jaheen, um, uh, a mentor of mine, and so glad she could be working on this project. So Dan, um, you know, if you want to introduce Susan, and I will turn it over to her. Yeah, great, Molly. Thanks for that uh, overview. So Susan is one of the world's top experts on mobility in the sharing economy. She's a professor in civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. She also, very importantly, is leading a major initiative on advanced transportation for the four institutes of transportation at UC, uh, us at Davis, Berkeley, Irvine, and UCLA. And she was also recent head of the executive committee of the Transportation Research Board. And I would point out, she was also the first Honda Distinguished Scholar in Transportation at the Institute of Transportation Studies here at UC Davis from 2000 to 2012, where she had earlier received her PhD. And as I said, she's a uh, co-author of the policy brief. So Susan, take it away. Thanks so much, Dan. And uh... Dan was my advisor, and I'm so delighted to, to be able to collaborate very closely with him on this initiative, along with Molly and her team. So I am going to go over the first five uh, top 10 policy strategies, and Molly's going to take it from six to 10. And what I wanted to do is just start by saying that when we were putting this together, these are not prioritized in terms of where we think we should place the most emphasis, 
but we're going to go through them in terms of just the order in which they appeared in the paper. So I'm going to focus on the first five, which range from everything from public transit to pooling to some policies that have been adopted in California that encourage the application of electric vehicle technology with AVs, looking at that spatial geographic equity and ensuring safety. So I'm gonna focus on those first five and I'm gonna turn it over to Molly to take it on from workforce issues to that seamless routing, booking, accessible payment that we need to ensuring that we have access for people with disabilities, focusing on data collection, and then, and then concluding with evaluating insurance and liability. So policy number one, support automated vehicles that are complementary to public transit. So there's a number of potential mechanisms that we suggested in this policy brief. The first is to provide new grant opportunities for shared and automated services that complement public transit. And I will note that the Federal Transit Administration has already gotten started on this and also the Department of Energy. So there's many, I think, opportunities for us to understand all different aspects of behavior, economics, as well as um, vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emission considerations by looking at these pilots. I emphasize that we need an evaluation and a research component, not just the deployment component. Second, I think it's so important that we ensure this um, flexibility in, in funding. So when we think about Build Back Better, ensuring that there's the discretionary authority to allow the transit agencies to have that flexibility in their capital and operational budgets to complement AV services. And then third, Requiring or incentivizing AV passenger service companies to demonstrate that they operate an equitable share of service in disadvantaged communities uh, to qualify for permit programs or receive credits. So uh, finalizing our, our roundup of mechanisms here, really looking at equitable access for all populations. All right, so this is just a slide to um, show you that things are moving. And as Molly talked about in the Gartner curve, you know, that was back in 2019. We are seeing, I think, a tremendous amount of activity in what we call that level four automation. And that was the piece that, by the way, Molly was in the trial of disillusionment. And I think she was trying to provide us with hope that maybe it was moving out of that. And I think, I think. I put my tickets on it moving out of that trough of disillusionment because this is one area that I get super excited about. And, and you see these uh, operations all over the country, but also all over the world. And these are just um, a, a set of them, everything from Waymo um, all the way to Ollie and uh, lots of activity going on in this area. I just got a big grant to work with Optimus Ride on um, a connector shuttle. So dozens of these happening, if not more, <laughs> and they tend to be low speed. Okay, policy number two, discourage personal ownership of AVs and zero mile trips. So this is one that I spent a lot of time uh, researching and thinking about. So in terms of the mechanisms we suggest here is Levy, levy a registration fee for personally owned AVs. So try to discourage that. To b levy a road user fee that charges privately owned AVs on a greenhouse gas per mile basis with additional ch charges for empty miles while ensuring user privacy. So that gets the data component um, integrated into this particular suggestion or recommendation alongside uh, encouraging um, that we get away from those empty or zombie miles. And then to C is establish a fee bait program to support more efficient modes. So, so get those internal combustion engine vehicles out of the market and encourage more of the battery electric technology. 
and do this in a way that encourages multimodal transportation alongside being equitable. All right, so this is a figure that we thought was really interesting to show in terms of the number of permits that have come out in California as of March, 2021. And when working with Molly on these slides, I thought it was important to, to highlight a few aspects that I think are, are quite interesting is we've got about 18 total that are in this passenger service category. And then we're also seeing more application of that cargo. And we've seen this also occurring just in the straight up shared mobility space is some of the models are, are looking at, can we service food or delivery types of models. So it's not uh, too surprising to see that there's growth in this cargo area. And then there's also permits in areas such as just straight up vehicle sales, some unknown operational aspects. And then you can see the vast majority very much focused on the business to business hardware or software components. Policy number three, success. Encourage AVs to be deployed as zero emission vehicles. And I know we're going to get into a conversation here. We're going to be talking, I think, quite a bit about SB 500, but I'm not going to steal a lot of thunder from our um, discussions today. But what I will do is focus on these policy mechanisms. So establishing supply side incentives uh, that award extra ZEB credits to manufacturers for committing uh, that their AV fleets are going to be zero emission. Mandate that all AVs be rapidly electrified or incentivize such actions. And there we go, SB 500, which uh, requires that ZEVs in the state of California come on board as pure battery electric vehicles by 2030. And invest in public charging infrastructure that meets the needs of AVs. So we can't just think about the the technology and propulsion of the vehicles themselves, but do we have adequate charging infrastructure to support these zero emission vehicles? All right, so another couple of uh, histograms to share with you across these 55 um, companies permitting, what you can see to the, to the left where you see the yellow uh, histogram bars, I've highlighted here that about um, 18 of that 55, in terms of um, their desire or, or claiming that they would be deploying electric AVs, you can see a total of about 18 said that there was a possibility that they would do so. If we shift over to figure six to the right-hand side in the dark blue, if you look at what actually is occurring with those test permits is about 11 of those 55 companies are testing with electric AVs. Now, because I work in this space a lot, in the, in the defense of a lot of these companies, um, particularly some of the shuttle companies, there haven't been the electric vehicle models available that uh, they were able to put into their fleets. So I know many of these companies are very much committed to getting into the electric propulsion. All right, now I wanna talk a bit about land use because I think this is really important in the context of automated vehicles. Policy number four, encouraging AV mobility services to provide service in rural and suburban areas, not just those urban core areas, and especially focusing on low income or disadvantaged communities that might not have good access to reliable vehicles or vehicles at all. So starting out with 4A, providing guidance for communities interested in AVs to conduct an equitable community needs assessment to ensure that AV services are the right choice for communities and ensuring equitable and sustainable long-term outcomes. So we highlight those words there in terms of really focusing on equity and also engagement, intentional inclusion of the community in these choices. Awarding state tax credits or direct subsidies to companies for meeting service goals, for operating AVs in rural disadvantaged communities and expanding access uh, overall, including EV infrastructure so that people can charge these vehicles uh, in their neighborhoods. And then finally, 
mandating or incentivizing minimum service thresholds for publicly funded automated electric vehicle service in rural areas and rural disadvantaged communities. We didn't go so far as to, to suggest that they always be shared in these contexts, but that there be automated electric vehicles in these areas. And then I'm gonna wrap it up on my side with policy number five, address safety both for passengers inside automated vehicles and for pedestrians, bicycles, and all people who will interact with AVs. So other road users, establish regulations that hold passenger service AVs to a set of safety and security performance measures that align data collection to outcomes. I love that one. 5B, establishing regulations that hold AV cargo providers, so people that might not be uh, transporting people but goods, to a set of clear safety and security performance measures made specifically for those cargo AVs. And then finally, establishing AV reporting requirements that encourage public accountability for AV-related safety incidents and ensuring there's no disparity in safety outcomes by race, income, or mode. So focusing on that social equity and access. So we wanted to just say that there's, there's definitions here that I think are important to consider. So safety in the context of our policy brief is focused on protection from accidental harms, whereas we're defining security is the protection from intentional harms. And finally, I just wanted to note that the California Public Utilities Commission includes safety reports for shared automated vehicles that operate in fleets. So this is a really important reporting requirement. It gives us a lot of insights. And then finally, automated vehicle transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft will submit a plan outlining how they intend to orient consumers to the technology minimize risks and respond to harassment or hostile individuals on board. And that also includes uh, Waymo, of course, Bert. <laughs> and with that, I believe I'm going to be taking us over to Molly, who's gonna take us from six to 10 on the top 10. Molly, I think you're muted. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, thanks again, Susan. Um, I wanted to um, thank Ken Karani for these interesting definitions of safety and security, which um, really did build my understanding of how we can differentiate issues um, and also think about purview. I think that's an important question. So um, I also think this design work, which was done by some other researchers at UC Davis, Angela Seneguinetti and Beth Ferguson, um, was really interesting as well really focusing on how we can think about design challenges um, associated with AVs and how, and how those, um, those, those, those decisions that are made by vehicle designers will affect their um, safety and their, um, their usability for, 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 for shared fleets. Um, also, I'll mention that, um, you know, we, which has been discussed, uh, that will be discussed later, um, the uh, state of California did pass SB 570, which modernized the vehicle code um, to make uh, it more possible for AVs to, um, to operate in the absence of a human driver, um, providing some exemptions from vehicle code requirements. So um, I think others, the panelists know more about that than me, but I'd like uh, to just mention that this, this discussion of how to redefine vehicle design for AVs is, is an ongoing one and an opportunity for you know, our community, the transportation you know, thinkosphere as it's called to, to sort of weigh in at this stage as, as these decisions will be made really very soon. Um, so I will switch it over to a new topic. Um, and don't be overwhelmed by trying to read this huge and interesting graphic, but I'm switching this over to policy number six, which is labor. And these, this is an art, um, a graphic that was developed by the Future of Work Commission in their most recent public meeting. I'm gonna, um, there's a link on the bottom for um, if you want to see the full uh, caricature, but I will switch it to just one small section, which I noticed where, um, which really stood out to me, where the criteria of good work are living wage, safe, safety, 
benefits, access to training, potential for wealth building, dignity. Um, and so we need to think about this context when we talk about workforce and development associated with automated vehicles. Um, we, there were specific recommendations. This is just highlights from the, um, the department, um, the Future of Work Commission, um, which I thought were important to highlight here and informed our, our recommendations for this, re, for, for this re research effort. So um, th those include supporting workers in transition and in encouraging um, development of new skills, um, in improving safety um, by using technology to improve safety, and building scare skills that prepare a job for the jobs of the future. So supporting workers in transition, safely enabling them um, to work safely on the job, and also building skills that prepare them for the future. These, these are themes that we, we apply to our work. Um, and you know, another thing I'll mention about this commission is that they also mentioned in the very beginning that, that, that they plan to go, they didn't wanna focus exclusively on technological change and automation because there's a wider range of topics that are critical to the future of work. So when we talk about automation in the context of labor, we should recognize that this, um, that we need to provide important, importantly, there's a, many other issues that surround the future of work beyond just automation and technological change. Um, so, but uh, I'll move on to quickly talk about what we recommended in our, in our effort here, um, which is of course a narrow subset of, of what needs to be done to ensure that workers are, are supported in the future. We suggested that we establish workforce impact mitigations for associated specifically for vehicle automation, and that these could include targeting retraining, um, investing in how automation can yield safety benefits um, for workers and community members, um, and targeting data collection to monitor workforce safety and effects. Um, and I'll just mention that, you know, one of the, um, you know, things that this Future Work Commission, I think, did and will continue to do is, um, you know, ensure that there's a robust stakeholder engagement process. And, and you know, I think the ITS Davis and others were, were eager to be part of that uh, process. So, um, and I know RIMI, the, the uh, Renew Resilient and Innovative Mobility Initiative is also focused on labor um, as well. So I'll turn now to policy number seven, um, which focuses on AV booking and payment. Um, focusing on booking and payment seems really in the weeds, but look, this is, you know, we're like we like I mentioned before, we're at, you know, on year five of discussing these topics and we can't stay high level. We're, we're in the weeds because that's what needs to happen now. We need to think about not just our objectives, but how do we actually make it happen? What are the policy mechanisms that get us there? So for ensuring that AVs are, in, are, are open and seamless and accessible, uh, we suggest that um, that the state investigates some of these uh, strategies, which include requiring AV providers to use open loop payment, which just means um, EMV based um, payment systems like debit or credit card, um, rather than closed loop systems like many uh, transit agencies use for their ticketing, um, which narrow the number of payment options that you can, that you can use. Um, this is actually an equity issue um, as well. We need to make sure that mobility providers offer alternatives to cash um, so that we meet community needs, um, and and we can and we can do that in a way. There's you know new and innovative ways where we can provide um, community members up with many different locations to convert cash to um, for use on on these platforms. And there has to be a, a supported effort to ensure that 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 happens. Um, and then um, we also need to provide resources for transit and mobility providers to offer online and telephone booking. Um, which has happened. The market has borne that out to some extent, but um, but we want to make sure that that continues um, at, and to ensure that everyone has ability to access this new mobility strategy. So I'm going to turn to another, an extremely important topic that we've been focusing on, uh, wheelchair accessibility. And this is a, um, a design mock-up for a new wheelchair accessible cruise origin. Um, and, um, you know, of course, this is not in operation today, although there are several other um, wheelchair accessible vehicles, automated vehicles in the world. Uh, one is Main Mobility has a wheelchair accessible vehicle, but unfortunately that vehicle is not ADA compliant. Um, and, um, and it's not clear to me whether this one will be as well, but there may be some barriers to compliance. But I think that what we wanna suggest that happens with um, associated with wheelchair accessibility is that we, we ensure that you know, this, um, much of the promise of, of AVs is associated with uh, improving accessibility. So let's not 
make that just an empty promise. It's important that we see real policy action to ensure that that um, it's not just the, the gold star um, companies that are thinking about accessibility, but it's 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 across the board, and that everyone is thinking about accessibility as they roll out their fleets of, of automated vehicles. Um, we need to, but from the policy standpoint, we got to get again quite in the weeds here and define key terms like accessibility, um, accessible AV service, equivalent AV service. It, it sounds. Um, so, so specific, but it's extremely important because believe it or not, the CPUC has, um, has avoided defining those terms. They asked the, the public for feedback on how to define the terms. And then they decided, oh wait, we, we actually can't define these terms. And I think that's um, an interesting decision. And when that we understand that this term accessibility has some homonyms, but we need the state to clarify how it should be applied in the law. Um, and um, we also wanna see that, that we established guidelines to direct uh, parallel efforts um, within the CPUC. Right now, there's an, there's several different rulemakings that are quite separate. One, one regulating AV, AVs operating as TNCs, and one requiring that TNCs, the existing TNCs on the road today, um, provide more wheelchair accessible vehicles in their fleet. We need to see those rulemakings combined. We need to see there's the efforts, clear, clarity on where whether AVs will be able to participate in um, the wheelchair accessible access for all fund, which encourages more um, uh, accessible vehicles to enter the TNC fleet. Um, that, if that isn't the case, if AVs will not participate in the CPUC program, we need to think about how we develop an alternative classification for AV TNCs um, and maybe new metrics that apply for accessibility goals for that group. Um, and you know, it's, it doesn't have to be a one size fits all, but we do need to see movement to incorporate AVs into the into the um, um, into the wheelchair accessibility conversation at the state level, um, we also need to think about how community-owned enterprises and nonprofits can increase the availability of AV services for people with disability. Um, and so, you know, this was uh, one that was um, in some uh, we 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 discussed this, these policy recommendations with a large number of stakeholders. I should have said that in the beginning. Um, and this was one that was supported by a number of, of community groups to ensure that, you know, that the state is really um, co-creating solutions with, with individuals who are um, affected. So um, I'll just mention this. Also, we have done some research. This is a sort of a side note, but just um, we'll have a paper um, we're working on um, that focuses on accessibility, uh, wheelchair accessibility legal activities. Um, and um, those include um, this independent living center versus San Francisco uh, uh, versus Lyft, excuse me, versus Lyft. Um, and um, basically this is an interesting uh, legal case in that the judge has ruled that Lyft is required to adhere to Title III of ADA, which there was some doubt because they aren't uh, specifically a transportation company, but they are required to do so. Uh, but they said that the, the plaintiffs failed to establish that there was a reasonable method for Lyft to comply um, in this case. Um, and there's a similar case uh, um, between Equal Rights Center versus Uber, um, and there hasn't been a determination in that one yet, um, at least not from my knowledge. Um, but the question I think we need to ask on the legal side is whether ADA will apply to future AV operation. Um, and um, I think that it likely will. There's less ambiguity about whether many AVs companies will operate more as a charter or as a, a microtransit provider, meaning that they would be more likely to, um, to be required to, um, to comply with Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, the ADA. Um, so I think that there probably will need to be, um, you know, uh, an effort to try to think through what this really looks like um, and do so on, on the regulatory stage. So I'll turn quickly, um, you know, and I apologize for sort of jumping around to all the different topics, but, you know, I think that the idea here was to try to provide a comprehensive list of policies, strategies for the state. So, um, you know, of course that, that means we have to jump around a bit. So bear with us while we do that. <laughs> um, so uh, the, I think these last two strategies are, are on data and insurance and they're related. So first I'll mention about data, data collection across agencies is critical. Um, we need to uh, establish data analysis protocols that complement the existing and planned data collection strategies. Right now, both DMV and CPC are going to be collecting data on uh, AV companies, and I think there needs to be an effort to try to, um, to ensure that those data collection strategies are integrated. 
um, and that would in, in, probably improve um, the interaction between the companies and the state um, and avoid some of the um, concerns that there's either duplication of data collection or, um, or gaps um, that might, might um, uh, diminish the state's ability to, um, you know, to make informed decisions in the future. Um, and then we've also suggested that they establish a data clearinghouse. And this is something that we've suggested in previous papers as well. And, um, you know, it's an idea that, um, you know, could address some of the concerns around data sharing um, because it could allow some different um, levels of access for different types of, of users um, so that data could be shared and evaluated by the, the public. The last, the last top 10 policy suggestion it, uh, a strategy that we're that we're um, suggesting here, and I, by suggesting, I don't say that these are are, are firm recommendations. We're actually in the sort of investigatory stage, and we want more research to be done on each of these to think about through amongst them, which is the best strategy in terms of mechanisms, and between them, what our priorities are. Um, but I'll say the last strategy I think is on risk analysis, on assigning liability to um, to identify insurance needs for companies. Right now, the currently the DMV requires something of a cookie cutter $5 million coverage, which can be done by insurance or by surety bond. Um, and there maybe need to be more specific AV insurance minimums that better match liability risks for different types of AV fleets, um, maybe based on the number of vehicles they, they have or the, the types of risk profiles they're, um, they're under or the types of efforts they've taken to address some of the issues that we mentioned here, including cybersecurity, um, sensors, infrastructure. Um, and so I think thinking through what that uh, liability risk is will, and better matching insurance um, to that will probably be something that will have to happen down the line. Um, and we've talked with the California Department of Insurance about this um, as well. So um, I think I'll, uh, the last, uh, so the um, last thing I'll say is that the, um, that this effort is really a, a beginning and not an end. And we really planned, this is just a laundry list of different policy ideas. Um, and there needs to be much more work to refine them, to think through some of the trade-offs, to think through some of the timing. We heard from stakeholders and city government that there's urgency for some of these topics. And then there may be more time to pause and, 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 and do reflection on others. And so we need, we need to hear that from, the state needs to hear from the stakeholders to understand where they need to act fast and where they have time to, to carefully evaluate. Um, so I think that's that, that's the next step in this in this whole in this whole effort, and we plan to continue it. So thank you. Thanks, thanks, Molly and Susan. That was great. As a few people noted, this is really an extraordinary, extraordinary deep dive into policy, AEB policy, and I think is a is a real contribution. Uh, and of course, this effort, as Molly said, is continuing. Um, so let me let me just make two little comments, and I'm going to introduce our two uh, um, two uh, panel other panelists. And the first one is that I want to emphasize that we all understand and appreciate that actually the number one strategy is to support innovation. And so, in case anyone thinks this is just a bunch bunch of government bureaucrats and regulators and academics, you know, focusing on you know, all these uh, policy issues. So that was for Bert's benefit mostly. Uh, and the other thing I just want to clarify when Susan, I know Susan referred to electric vehicles and I know she meant that it also includes fuel cell electric vehicles when she says that. Okay, so now let me turn for, to uh, one of our panelists um, from Zooks and that's Bert Kaufman. And I'm turning to him because I know all of you are saying, saying, okay, how real is all this? And, you know, uh, Molly introduced this idea of, of the hype curve. So um, Bert's gonna respond to that. He's head of public policy and regulatory affairs at Zooks, where he's been for five years. And prior to that, he was a senior advisor in the office of Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker has a, uh, has a law degree and before graduate school, he worked for CNN. Uh, and so, Bert, can you tell us first, how real are these 
automated vehicles. Your company is one of the leading. And after that, mention this little uh, affiliation you have with Amazon and what that means. So start out with, okay, how real is it? Terrific. And um, it's uh, really, really great to be here today, uh, Professor Sperling, Professor Shaheen, Molly, um, um, Lori, you know, to be on, on a panel with, with these distinguished experts um, is, is really significant for us. Um, you know, uh, I like to say uh, that, that we are a three revolutions company, right? Um, uh, you know, three revolutions you know, identified the huge opportunity with uh, connected autonomous and electric vehicles. And, and we are really, I think, in the early days of the convergence of these revolutions. And you know, just to sort of set a perspective as to where we are, you know, we think that the transition um, to autonomous vehicles, like the one you see behind me, um, is as significant as the transition uh, from the age of the horse and carriage into the age of the automobile. And of course, the technology that allowed us to get from there to here was the internal combustion engine. And so when you look at what autonomous technology and robotics means for the transition, it is, it is very profound. The other thing I'll say is, you know, when you're talking about autonomous technology, we really think it's important to be specific. And so there, as, as we talked about uh, today already, there's so many different kinds of use cases and approaches um, to this technology. Um, you know, we think that the right application of this technology is actually not retrofitting sensors and compute onto a conventional car. Um, you know, the conventional cars are really built around uh, everything a human driver needs to be able to successfully and safely complete the driving task. And um, robotics and AI allows us to reimagine form factors. So how real is this? The vehicle you see behind me is uh, you know, the world's uh, first fully autonomous battery electric vehicle designed uh, for a ride-sharing duty cycle that can go up to highway speeds, but is primarily um, focused on, uh, on serving um, in an ur a dense urban environment. And that's um, where we chose to start out at Zooks because that's where a lot of the problems around safety risks are, congestion, pollution um, are. And you know, I, I think that a lot of people look at this technology through the lens of what we were experiencing a decade ago with the advent of uh, on-demand rideshare when our mobile phones really enabled that. And I think that is cer certainly an important lens to consider this technology, but um, you know, we are still not deploying this vehicle behind me in cities. Um, we are testing the software at this stage um, on public roads, on private test tracks, um, in, in simulation to validate that this technology works because the number one most important uh, policy priority for all of us um, is, is safety, right? And so, you know, you need to really um, have a high degree of confidence that, um, you know, we are developing a system that um, is at least as safe and I mean, I would argue it needs to be uh, safer than um, you know a human driver on the road. So I would say largely that is where um, the industry is today. You are starting to see um, limited deployments of this technology um, on public roads, um, you know, across the country and around the world. Most of those deployments, though, are in conventional vehicles that have been uh, retrofitted um, with sensors. So. You know, it, it is going to be a shallow ramp from um, where we are today to where this technology is um, is more in the field, and communities and cities are going to be on notice uh, that this is coming. This is not going to be the same kind of um, paradigm as when you know uh, Uber and Lyft started matching riders and drivers in cities. When all of a sudden thousands of new vehicles were in urban environments um, doing that, I think you know in that case cities were caught flat-footed. Um, in this case, you know, the, the, this technology is to, contingent upon charging infrastructure, maintenance infrastructure, um, you know, maps uh, the, that, uh, you know, the validation of, a, of an operational design domain. So all of this sort of work uh, that, that needs to be done before you can uh, begin a deployment. So, um, you know, I know it, 
it sounds kind of repetitive because we've been having this conversation now for, for a while. Um, we've never been closer to having this technology on public roads. We've come a, a long way. Um, there is still some time to go, but I'm really excited for what the next, I would say, to three to five years entail for you know, the kinds of deployments that will involve um, you know, the vehicles that we've been developing. Uh, thanks, Bert. You know, I think you made an important point is that as we look forward to this, it's going to be a gradual uh, introduction and, and eventually transformation, but it's going to take a while. And, and that actually highlights even more what we're talking about here is making sure we get the policy right so that we can influence the business models and the technology going forward. So thanks. That was Oh, oh, you, although you didn't say anything about Amazon, so well, I will. Yeah, let me address that. And um, you know, the the pandemic, this pandemic has been, you know, obviously, um, it's affected all of us in so many ways, and a lot has happened um, as we um, continue to push forward from wherever you know we're we're um, uh, engaging in our professional lives. But one of the most significant things that happened to to us to Zooks during the pandemic is that um, in August of, of 2020, we were acquired by uh, Amazon. And we're really excited about that partnership. We're, we're a wholly owned independent subsidiary of Amazon. And um, when they acquired us, their message to us was loud and clear. Um, they want us to keep developing the system that we've been developing since we were founded in 2014. And I would say that you know a traditional vehicle development program, um, you know, costs about a billion dollars and takes five years. And uh, that's basically uh, was, was the, you know, Zooks 1.0 was developing this vehicle you see behind me. Um, this vehicle is undergoing, uh, you know, crash tests on private, uh, private road networks now and doing a lot of, uh, of testing. And we hope to see some deployments of it um, in the near future. But Amazon has been, you know, very supportive of, of our strategy um, from the uh, you know day one of the acquisition, and, and we're really pleased to be a part of um, you know the uh, company. Okay, great, great to know you're still sticking with the passenger vehicles, but I understand yes. from conversations it could include deliveries. But um, you know that question comes up quite a bit. It's like um, you know if uh, when are you going to do your delivery vehicle? And and our response is you know uh, understand the question. If you can develop an autonomous system that can, um, you know, drive around a city and and move people around, you can imagine it also um, one day moving uh, goods around as well. Okay, so let's move to Lori Pepper. So Lori was appointed Deputy Secretary for Innovative Mobility Solutions in the California Transportation Agency by Governor Newsom a couple of years ago. Prior to that, she worked in Washington, D.C. as a senior uh, federal policy specialist for Honda North America, where she focused on technology and innovation, including automated vehicles. So, Laurie, the question to you is, you know, all this talk about is about California. In fact, most of these companies are headquartered in California. Um, but a lot of I've heard people say, well, California is lagging. Uh, is California leading or following, at least from a regulatory and policy perspective? Um, yeah, that's an interesting conversation uh, question. Um, and first, you know, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I was very excited. Um, I think when I got the draft version of the paper, I believe back in March, and um, I'm happy to see that it's been finalized and, and look forward to taking a closer look. Um, as far as California leading or following, I believe, you know, California certainly has led, right? California was the first state out with a comprehensive um, autonomous vehicle testing and deployment regulations package. Um, as other states are looking at, you know, what has happened and what's appropriate for, for their populations and their residents, um, I do believe that they look at California now, whether they go with what California has done or they do something else. Um, I don't think anybody can say that California has been following um, anybody. Uh, California is doing what we believe is right for, for our residents. Great. Okay, so California is leading. 
Is that the short answer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And, you know, I mean, what Laurie is saying is really important because, you know, we are, you know, a lot of the, the companies, you know, they start like Waymo started in Arizona, but they soon realized that the, the market is not in Arizona. The market is in the San Francisco's and LA's of the world. And the California market tends to be innovative. And so we are, I mean, for me as a part-time regulator, as a member of the Air Resources Board, you know, we all are looking at how to, how to make sure we can encourage these technologies, but in a way that's in the public interest. So that was, thank you, Laurie. So we've got many great questions here from the audience. Um, maybe I'll start. Okay, here's a softball one to get us started here. Um, there's a question about the role of micromobility with AVs. And I guess maybe, well, maybe Susan, you want to start on that? And this can be a short, you know, this, we've got lots of questions here. So maybe just a quickie on that. And can you read me the, okay, so I see it. What role will micromobility have in the future of AVs? Well, we hope that people are going to be walking and biking and taking their scooters right alongside of AVs. And I think that's in part why we think this uh, getting ahead of the technology with policy is so important so that we ensure that we're keeping people in active transportation modes right alongside of automated vehicles. Thanks. Um, so I did get corrected by someone on chat about Waymo and it, Waymo is a California company. It's part of Google and it did start in California, but their first uh, commercial or semi-commercial service was in Arizona. Although now they're going big time in San Francisco and, and the South Bay. All right. Um, let's see some good provocative if any of any of you have any and so all four panelists you're all on board here so if you if you come across one you really want to answer let me know um otherwise okay here's another pretty easy one uh sb 500 the california law is limited to vehicles under 8500 pounds which is light duty vehicles but a lot of those shuttles are over 8500 should should we be extending it to uh medium duty, any thoughts on that? I'd say why not? But I would say also that, that a lot of the current vehicles are under that threshold in terms of weight, Dan, but that could become higher as they move towards battery electric or fuel cell technology. But I say, why not? Why not expand it? Okay, here's a question that now we're getting a little more provocative here. Um, so I don't know uh, who's going to want to answer this, but um, about the Public, Public Utility Commission. So this is going to be a generic question across the U.S. about regulation. Um, so the question is, is the PUC capable of regulating this fleet for the state or would more local control similar to taxis be appropriate? And I'm pretty sure almost everyone on this panel has an opinion, but let me <laughs> let me start on the industry <laughs> side. Uh, maybe, Bert, what do you say? Sure. Well, I think one of the unique features of California, and, and I would definitely agree with uh, what Lori said earlier, it has not been a laggard in the policy um, development of this technology at all. It's actually been, been a leader. And, and that you know, does does provide a lot of predictability to industry, which, you know, is, is really, I think, at the end of the day, quite helpful. Um, you know, my other view on this is that a lot of the development uh, in this technology is taking place. California is home to so much of the development of this technology. And, you know, Zook's got its start in a derelict firehouse on the grounds of the, um, if I can say this, Susan, the Stanford Linear Accelerator um, over on the peninsula. But, you um, you know, I, I think, you know, California correctly recognizes uh, that, you know, the innovators and the regulators have got to figure out a way to work together um, as this technology develops, because this is not just taking software, creating an app and then pushing it out there. 
um, you know, these vehicles are going to be interacting uh, on, on public roads. And so you really have to have uh, safety as your foundation to this. Um, you know, to the specific question about the Public Utilities Commission, I do think this is a, you know, relatively unique feature of California. And, you know, on the one hand, from our position, it is, it is really helpful, useful, predictable to have a state, you know, regulator because California is a big state. Um, there are um, a lot of communities uh, to serve and uh, it would be quite uh, cumbersome to have to go community by community and, and sort of adjust based on what the local um, you know, community says. On the other hand, I do get the argument that you know, larger cities might uh, want to have more of a say in how this technology rolls out. I think there are tools that local communities have in terms of how they manage land use, curb use, um, that kind of thing that um, you know, can play a role in, in this technology. So um, you know, California is unique in that for a company like us, we come under uh, PUC jurisdiction, we come under DMV jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, I think that that works for, for where we are right now. Um, okay, let me generalize that a little bit. Um, and that is that actually we're talking about a lot of different policies here in practice. And so I would think, Bert, you'd like to actually have the federal government do some of the regulating <laughs> and to just extrapolate what you're saying. But it's entirely appropriate if we go to some of the policies that uh, Susan and Molly are talking well, about to have local regulation. Right? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, and I think um, when you look at how, uh, I mean, the big, big real questions about how uh, the, um, that how the automobile has been regulated across um, the federal government, states, and cities. And, you know, if you look at how things are oriented today and how the paradigm exists today, really the federal government has a very, very clear role in the safety performance of vehicles um, and the safety performance of vehicles on, on any public road in the, in the United States. Um, you know, states have a very clear role in the safe operation and the operation of uh, vehicles on public roads in the states. And so I think those lines are, are pretty clear in terms of um, sort of predictability when it comes to how the federal government is going to look at um, you know, the, the safe performance and operation of the system, there's no doubt that a federal framework um, is really, really important. Um, but I do think that, um, and you, you start to see this play out across the states, right? Um, you know, California has a very clear regulatory regime with both the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, so for folks that are joining us from outside of California, this in general regulates um, utilities, right? The public utilities, so um, electricity, telecommunications, um, the common carrier. And uh, it's premised on the theory that, you know, eventually we will be a, a common carrier. And so the other big point here is that uh, regulators, I think, are using this opportunity to get educated into this technology. So one of the things that the the paper discusses is uh, is data, right? And and it pointed to some data that exists today, and and data that informs future policies. And I think what's interesting is like you know, are the data that are being collected today the right kinds of data? Um, you know, did did you know has government asks asked for the right things at this stage? Because once you ask for it, once you start getting it, you've got to figure out what to do about it, how to act on it, and what is it uh, what does it mean? So, yeah, you know, informing, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please finish your point. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. So I think informing these uh, uh, regulatory agencies, whether it's the DMV or the Public Utilities Commission um, is, is really important because you're able to then um, implement policy solutions based on some of the data that um, you get. Right, I think that, you know, there's so much of, of what you said I agree with. I think that I'll just underscore that you know, we have this sort of layer cake federalism, right? Dual federal federalism in this country. And we've, and, um, and I think AVs are to some extent breaking that system, right? breaking the rules um, and, and making and forcing the state to behave and to take on some um, regulatory efforts that they aren't necessarily, aren't within their traditional purview. Um, and, you know, that's why I mentioned SB 570 um, before, 
Now I'm blinking out. That's the right. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, SB 570, because you know I think that this um, this underscores the fact that there has been a lack of federal action on regulating um, the beyond pro providing exemptions. Um, and I think that um, you know, so the question was about locals and how locals can play a role. And then you know, around the country, we've seen different efforts. Right? Boston had their own AV testing apparatus. Right? The fact that Boston had to do that was um, uh, because they felt like there was not enough testing hap requirements happening on the on, on various other levels, right? Um, and you know, I think um, when the DMV seeks to, I, I, this is a question I actually have for Lori, and maybe you can weigh in, but or maybe this is a question she, she'll defer to her DMV colleagues. But I'm curious, you know, to, to some extent, the, the the deployment permits that have been granted have been granted within a narrow set of geographic areas, right? Both of them are actually in San Francisco proper. I imagine if the DMV is going to approve those, um, those permits, they're gonna to communicate to San Francisco and ensure that the city feels ready to have that uh, deployment occur within their boundaries. Um, if that conversation isn't happening, I think that would be a concern. But my guess is that they are coordinating and communicating with the local officials to ensure that they, uh, you know, police and fire are ready for these vehicles and that you know full deployment can occur. So I think there is local a, a local role, even if there is state level decision making happening. So actually the companies that want the deployment permit are required to contact the local police departments and, and emergency responders as well as city governments um, to inform them about what they're doing. Um, the premise of that is because we don't want to speak to their business model. Uh, we want to do that as little as possible. That's not our, um, it's just not our, our, our responsibility. And I believe the companies also want to be able to handle those questions themselves. So Laurie, I've got another question for actually from Richard Mudge. And I think this is your, for you. He says, as an ex budget person, when I hear the word policy, I think of money. Your paper, our paper focuses only on regulations once AVs are deployed. Is there, and so the question for you is, is there a need for, or is there value in more active policy? And I think what he means is more grants and, and support in that way. And I think maybe Susan might wanna add on to that, but Laurie? <laughs> I was going to say, I believe we've actually had these conversations about um, investment and, and more research. And um, from my perspective, yes, I believe that um, we should be doing more research. But of course, uh, where's the funding coming from? And so, um, you know, I, I think that there are um, many avenues uh, by which we can uh, can fund certain pilots. But um, as the state, we are always open to doing more research and testing more scenarios, absolutely. What about spending money? I mean, I can't make any promises because <laughs> I'm not a budget person, <laughs> I'm a program person. But um, uh, I believe, you know, everybody has to make the case for, for spending the taxpayer money and um, the state certainly spends money, the money that it has, but you have to compete for those funds against so many different priorities. Dan, one of the policy recommendations that I covered talked about, I think the importance of, for example, in the public transit industry, that there be some discretionary funding and funding flexibility to do the type of experimentation that's needed and, and have that critical research right alongside of the deployment. So I know you know I'm a big fan of more research and disseminating those findings so we can we can push forward and, and share knowledge and not repeat the same experiment over and over again. And I yep. totally agree with that, <laughs> with making, uh, making research results public so that people can work smart and not hard and that we don't have to repeat everything everywhere. Okay, I got a few questions about one of the revolutions, the shared part. So Bert says, you know, his company is committed to all three. I know Cruz says the same thing. So one of the, so there's a few questions about this. One is the, the political aspect of it is how politically feasible is it to incentivize shared, shared AVs and, you know, follows on and he says, how do we keep it from being politicized in a typical left-right dynamic. 
is that possible? And there are a couple other questions that relate to this same thing, but in terms of, you know, the sharing revolution has probably been the one that suffered the most the last two years that, you know, we've seen people reluctant to use transit, Uber pool and Lyft have, have both canceled their pooling services. So um, this is a really important, probably maybe it's the most important question here uh, before us. So who wants to jump in on that? I think a few of you have opinions. We, so, I mean, we have I, the po- I, so we have the politics of it and we have the policy aspects of it and actually the business model aspects. Yeah, I mean, and you, I think, describe this so eloquently in the in the book, right? It's like you, you paint the heaven scenario, which is a scenario where there's a lot of sharing and, um, uh, you know, constrained uh, sort of fleet sizes that encourage encourage sharing. And I, and I think there's also the other scenario, which is like, you know, everybody's requesting one of these and it's single occupancy vehicle, which is not, you know, not solving the problem um, at the end of the day. And, and, you know, we recognize that governments have spent decades trying to, especially here in California, have spent decades, you know, trying to incentivize sharing. And, you know, it's, you haven't quite cracked the code. And so you hope with this technology through tools like, um, you know, customer through, through a riding experience, through tools like pricing, um, you can really use them to uh, incentivize uh, those shared rides. The other tool is like you know routing and 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 mapping, right? Uh, using technology to determine you know where, where people are going and and how to pick people up and move them in the same direction. Um, and so you hope that you know those three things can can lead to um, uh, more sharing. And um, you know, in terms of other kinds of governmental incentives, um, you know, I. I don't know, but I do think that uh, de- a, an industry player like uh, Zooks or sort of others in the space can use use those three mechanisms to encourage more more sharing. Yeah. Before the others answer this, you know, I'll highlight that you know the sharing part has really been tra- even trashed lately. You know, New York yes. Times had an article just a day or two ago, um, you know, saying how. Lyft and Uber are actually detrimental to the environment. We're seeing a lot of papers and research on that. You know, what they're all missing is that we have a built this car centric culture. You know, we've become so car dependent, which works for a lot of people, but doesn't work for many. Yes. And also has a lot of detrimental adverse effects. And so, you know, I guess I would just say, Bert, we're, we're cheering you on because <laughs> Really, sharing is 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 key to all of this being ses- successful, including for the, you know, the TNC uh, growth. Yes. Um, okay, I'm, who else? I, I'm, I'll take I'll... that one. Uh, um, so I think that um, yeah. So I think that um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot to unpack here, but I appreciate Dan that you mentioning this piece, um, and there's been many that are emphasizing the sort of um, the, the the sustainability challenges that have face the TNC industry. I think, you know, that's why I think sharing is such a public priority because once you can achieve that level of of customer penetration, then you can see those deadheading miles reduced. Um, When you can really truly see vehicle shedding and really more adoption, that's when you can see the vehicle miles, that's when we can anticipate that that's when we'll see the vehicle miles reduced on a, you know, per trip basis. So it's not surprising that when Uber and Lyft make up such a small market share of overall driving miles that there's going to be a significant amount of deadheading. I think, you know, I'm glad to see this research find that. And we saw that in San Francisco, there, there's really great research that points towards congestion impacts of Uber and Lyft vehicles. And certainly we need to think about strategies to address those impacts. But again, um, private vehicles, privately operated vehicles are the dominant vehicle on the road. Um, and so instead, until we see vehicle shedding, you know, we won't, we won't really so um, see change um, in terms of traffic congestion or BMT. Um, so we need to create a, a you know, multimodal fabric of different options and AVs could be one of those things, right? We don't see AVs as the only strategy um, and, and a shared um, a, a three revolutions future, this heaven scenario isn't one where the only way to get around is in a shared electric automated vehicle. Certainly that's absolutely not the case. And we wanna see um, a really a multimodal pro, um, you know, landscape, which in, certainly includes fixed route transit where it makes sense. 
Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think I'm repeating what uh, myself in, in, in that, you know, this is, these are commonly understood, um, you know, points within this, this talking space, but I feel like so often people say, well, people won't share, but they already do share um, in a lot of other settings. We know they share it to ride an airplane. We know they share to ride in other services. We need to make sharing the norm instead of the exception. And I think that there's a really an important role for policy to do that. Okay, so how do we do that? What are the policies? So okay. maybe Susan, I, you... Yeah, I'd love to jump in, Dan. And I, I was just getting nostalgic thinking about you and me walking around talking <laughs> about carpooling when I was trying to settle in on my doctoral dissertation topic, right? And pooling has been something that's come in and out of fashion, right? Government had a pretty strong role in encouraging carpooling dating back to the World War era. And at points in time, ride sharing is represented as much as 10% of the modal shift. So I think, or modal share. So what I think is that policy can make a difference. It's when I think the policy signals get really confused and jumbled. What's the objective? What's the mechanism? What are the barriers to sharing? That it becomes less effective. And in my study of carpooling, what I found is that the policies of the past started to lose their teeth and started to become like, are we trying to reduce parking? Are we trying to reduce congestion? Are we trying to improve air quality? And so the signals and the mechanisms sent from the federal government started to lose their teeth. I've done some research recently that look at, well, if we paid people to pool, to carpool, we gave you five bucks to pick somebody up, would you be willing to do that? What's your elasticity of demand for that in difference between say a dollar to $55? Well, price does matter. That's not surprising. So I think thinking about mobility wallets and, and how we can align this with pricing of our road transportation system as we have to get off the gas tax because we're moving towards electrification technologies. So I think how can we use these wallets to encourage that pooling behavior? But also what I would say is that we have to think about other barriers, travel time barriers. So using BERT, as you mentioned, uh, really good uh, operational strategies, better routing, use direct pooling, um, for rides that cost more and, and uh, indirect. So kind of use more of a taxi stand for ones that um, get a higher uh, incentive or subsidy. We also have to think about safety, gender related differences. We see these in the TNCs and in taxi literature alongside the absence of a driver and in AVs. So we have to align the policies and we also have to think about what are the barriers to pooling, but this has been done, right? Let's not forget about the past. The government did encourage pooling and it did work. And the one thing I'd also add to that is I'm, I'm really curious if there's a way to study this to the extent geometry matters because a current uh, pooling experience in an, in an Uber Lyft or, a, uh, or a Uber pool or Lyft line, you know, that's a conventional car where you might be sharing with people and somebody has got to get out and jump over people and you know, open the doors. You know, our vehicle is, is you see behind me that that whole experience is a totally different rider experience where, um, you know, the doors open, slide open on each side. Nobody really has to climb out uh, to uh, climb over another rider to get out. And, and I think that will also uh, help encourage the the whole experience of pooling um, in a pretty profound way. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Bert, is, is I think we need to think about why do people not pool? We know that not a lot of people prior to COVID were pooling in Uber and Lyft. Best case scenario, right? Somewhere between 20 to 30%. I've seen some studies that say 40. I'm a little dubious on that. Um, why weren't they pooling in that context? Okay, so, um, you know, part of this question, we don't have to address it, but, you know, is the political side of it is, is at least, are AVs going to be politicized? And I think more importantly, is sharing going to be politicized? And I guess I'll be interested in any thoughts, you know, but I would suggest that 
you know, we do worry about that with electric vehicles because we're going to hundred percent. We worry about it vaccination because we want to go to, you know, close to hundred percent, but, you know, shared AVs, you know, yeah, it'd be great to get to hundred percent, but I don't think that's anyone's really aspiring to that in anytime soon. So maybe that's not so critical an issue about, you know, the politi politicizing, you know, providing, creating incentives and policies that support sharing. Any, any thought, quick thoughts on that? So I, I, I think you're right, right? I think, I think um, I'm not so concerned about a, a right left type of debate on autonomous vehicles at this point. Um, I could be wrong. Um, but, um, you know, what we're looking at at the state is we are really looking at um, how do we create kind of a, an environment in which shared rides, not just pulling in an autonomous vehicle or any vehicle, but just shared rides like public transit, how do we make that more attractive and useful and inclusive um, for everyone so that we can get more choice riders? Um, one uh, program that we have, the Cal California Integrated Travel Project, which I believe was referenced on Molly's slide, um, what we're doing now is we are working, we're starting with transit agencies, and we are working on creating the technology to make sure that you can use what is in your digital or physical wallet to pay, as opposed to having to get proprietary cards. We are, we are working with the, the more than 400 transit agencies in the state of California to make sure that they can be seen on um, a data standard such as GTFS so that trip planning becomes a lot easier. And we are uh, looking at expanding that at some point in order to be able to create, and this goes well beyond transportation, but I know um, Susan was talking about mobility wallets, but we're trying to kind of go bigger and mobility wallets would fit under some sort of account where those who are not currently on the uh, banking rails, the unbanked and the underbanked, would be able to have a digital account um, with no penalty, no fee. It's definitely not a silver bullet, but it's something that would bring in even more people. And then if you don't have to have exact change, because I believe cash is also a barrier um, because needing to have exact change is something that I, I know I would not have. <laughs> um, and I know a lot of people don't and you know, bus drivers and uh, the, our, our train engineers, they don't want to sit there and, and be a bank either. Um, so making it easier and more accessible and more inclusive to move around um, in, the, in a multimodal type of environment is something that we are really focusing on. So we're trying to really focus on making things better. And the real vision for Cal ITP is a totally integrated mobility ecosystem. So again, starting with transit, testing the technology, making sure process works and everything, and then we'll start layering out. Um, and we hope that eventually the, uh, the private sector will start coming onto, um, you know, onto the program and, and joining us. And then people can, can make those choices much easier than we currently can. I know for myself, uh, I live in Sacramento, going to San Francisco. It's like, okay, I have to take, because I don't have a car, <laughs> I have to take uh, the light rail to the train station, take the train all the way to San Francisco, choose whether or not I'm going to get off um, at like Richmond to take BART into the city or, you know, um, it's like, or do I take the, the rapid bus? And there are so many things and I have to start at, okay, but what time do I actually need to be there? And it's a Quite honestly, it's a pain. <laughs> it's a lot of work just to plan that. And so it's something if we, we are able to integrate everything, it would be that the, the vision is that I would be able to say, okay, I need to be at, um, I don't know, pick a, pick a, pick a street in, in San Francisco by this time. And that a, a, an application like Google Maps or App, Apple Maps or Transit can say, great, here's where you have to go. Here's when you need to leave your home. All the, all the times are already coordinated and you can pay one time through the app and it's done. And that is something where if it's that easy, we are hopeful that we can get more people choosing to take shared transportation as opposed to just hopping in their car and driving. You know, Laurie makes a good point that, you know, bringing it back to the politics side of it, Paul Leiby had a good 
chat message here. I'm going to play off of it just for a second, but you know, Lori makes the point that we need to make it easy. We got to incentivize. We do need to be politically, we do need to be careful that we don't start advocating get, getting rid of cars, um, even though that's implicit <laughs> in what we're talking about. But you know, focus on making it a better experience. You know, Bert talked about that as well. Okay, I've got an easy question for Bert here. No. Mm -hmm. Doug Povich says, and I know it's easy. If you aren't retrofitting conventional vehicles with AV technology, don't you need to make sure the ground up design vehicles have not only software that make them safe, but also are built to satisfy FMVSS safety standards, recognizing that these standards will need to change somewhat to accommodate AVs? So I know you know the answer to that. <laughs> The, the short answer is yes. And, and what I'll say there is that the FMVSS, these are the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. So, uh, you know, a set of protocols governed by NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which um, has very, very clear, well delineated enforcement authority in this space. Um, the FMVSS are foundational uh, to the, um, you know, automotive safety uh, um, paradigm. They are foundational to allowing uh, for things like safety innovations, uh, a la seat belts and airbags that were once so foreign uh, to us that were like, how could we implement these things in our vehicles? And you know, I was like, I've seen some some recent clips of uh, you know the transition into uh, the requirement for uh, seat belt technology, and people are like, why would I do that? Um, you know, they equate it to getting. COVID vaccinated, which anyway, di a digression. Um, so yeah, the FMVSs are foundational. I think that there's no doubt uh, there will have to be some updates to them uh, for this new technology. Um, I think that there are several tools and mechanisms to ensure that um, you know the kind of technology that we're developing can um, be out there um, in a way that um, respects the FMVSs. Um, you know, the FMVSs at their core are a set of testing protocols. Um, for uh, various safety performance metrics. And you want, you want your safety standards, you want a lot of standards in this space to be performance-based because you know, the vehicle behind me is, is, is our first generation stab at what this uh, you know, new technology with what autom automation and AI technology will allow for. But that's not to say that the form factors won't change you know, in future generations. And, and so you want the ability to, to be nimble and flexible um, with that. But performance-based safety standards, which is what the FMVSS are, you know, are foundational. All right, we're getting near the end here. Okay, Molly, did you wanna say something? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Let me just interject and say that this is something we discussed prior, but uh, Kelsta has made, uh, did make a comment to the, to, to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration as they're developing how to, how to rethink how they um, how they regulate AVs um, and the automated driving systems, and you know, they suggested that there be a ADS, an automated driving systems competency test. Um, and I think this was something that I I forgot to mention in the presentation, but it's really important um, because performance measures are great, and I certainly suggest them in the paper. And it's something that we we do think is is worthwhile, but we also need to think through if there needs to be um, additional safeguards guards, additional guardrails um, as the industry expands um, to ensure that the vehicles are safe. And um, I'm, not ask, I'm not stating that and more asking, is this as a question, um, what kind of test would be, would make you feel comfortable with having thousands of these vehicles on the road? And how do we uh, ensure that our regulators are conveying that? Great, thanks Molly. So now we're just about at the end. So I was gonna give all of you, all four of you a chance to provide any lasting thoughts or comments. Uh, feel, be as provocative as you wanna be or not. <laughs> Who wants to start? Is I that... certainly can. <laughs> Anybody else is speaking up. So at the state, we have um, what's called an autonomous vehicle strategic framework that we started a couple of years ago. Um, things were put on pause, of course, during the pandemic um, soon. And we have been working with stakeholders. We had an outreach on the vision and guiding principles. We hope to come out with the final version of those soon. And then we are going to be moving on to how do we operationalize it, right, which is the action item list. 
And that is a list of um, state of actions that are either wholly or partially owned by the state and ones where we will publicly commit. And it's not just in the transportation agency um, and our departments, it's statewide. So it is PUC, it's um, the Workforce Development Board, it's CARB, we have um, everybody in the state structure is participating. And so you may get somebody reaching out informally um, during this fall. And then we will have, of course, a more formal outreach um, uh, plan next spring and summer. And I really just encourage everyone to please participate, to give us your thoughts. Um, if you you are not have not been involved to date, um, don't don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and you know, I think. Uh, the only way this works to do kind of this statewide vision and the statewide kind of holistic um, look at not how to get the technology on the road, but how to actually integrate this technology to the benefit of our communities. We really need everybody's participation. So that is my plea. <laughs> and I hope, uh, you know, we hear from all of you. Okay, thank you, Lori. Please, we're part of a legitimate uh, closing comment. Um, <laughs> Okay, who's that? Bert, you want to go next? I see you. So sure, I'll, I'll um, just you know leave you with this thought, and and that is um, you know we have to remember why I think this technology is developing, and um, you know it's not for the sake of technology, uh, you know developing a new technology. It's it is for the sake of helping people connect with with places, with other people, with with jobs, right? So that's really really um, important and. Um, you know, it does come down to um, solving problems, right? It's it's it is these problems of uh, safety risks on our roadways. I think you know that topic has been addressed at length um, in in a lot of other forums. It's uh, creating more opportunities for access to mobility, um, and then and then to do it in a way that uh, doesn't uh, add pollution to the atmosphere um, is 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 also um, you know uh, paramount. So. Uh, it's been great to participate in this discussion. Molly, I know we've talked over the uh, evolution of this uh, paper and kudos to you all um, for, for thinking so deeply about these issues. I think, you know, the other big aspect of this first engagement with first responders and law enforcement, because, you know, things that are, uh, we call edge cases, uh, are things that that community sees every day on the roadways. And so we've got a lot to learn uh, from the kinds of experiences uh, that, uh, that that community has in, um, in dealing with uh, mobility in general. So thanks again for, for allowing us the opportunity to participate. And if anybody has any questions, it's just uh, Bert, B-E-R-T at zooks.com. Nice, easy email. <laughs> yes. Um, Susan? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I wanted to just... Uh, thank all of you and in particular our guests, Bert and Lori for, for coming and, and sharing your thoughts with us um, regarding this uh, policy research. I wanted to just share, Dan, some findings that came from a study that uh, we did for UCITS about a year or so ago, synthesizing state level automated vehicle policy actions. And just leave you with some thoughts about some of the takeaways when we looked at a high level aggregate view of what states were focusing on. And what we found was that a lot of states are really focused on safety, testing and infrastructure. And so that's all super important, but a lot of what we've been talking about as part of this webinar and even in our 10 top 10 recommendations is that uh, we need to focus on a lot of other things, including economic benefits. And what we found when we looked at, the, at what the states were doing is quite a few did talk about economic benefits to their states, but they didn't talk so much about workforce challenges and changes. So love to do more work in that particular area. And we also found that there was less focus on the AV adoption process, like that transition. And I think that's something that's very important to focus on. And then finally, we found that very few states were considering AV implications for consumers. So Bert, you really raised this. Laura, you talked about it as well. 
Molly emphasized the importance of the data sharing aspects, cybersecurity, privacy, insurance and liability, and registrations and licensing, I think are examples of things that will impact consumers. So I'm optimistic for the future, but I think we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. And so our champion and leader, Molly, what any bring us home? That's how I see you. Um, so, um, so the um, I think everything that everyone's been said, I, I, I'll close there. Thank you so much for this fantastic um, session, um, for all of your help in refining this effort, this research effort. Um, and you know, um, let's continue this conversation um, next time. So uh, we'll we'll invite you all to participate in our upcoming events. Um, I'm looking forward to doing that. So thank you all. Uh, we can close it there. Thanks to Molly and Susan and Laurie and Bert. It's great. And thanks to all of you out there for, for listening and participating. And there'll be more coming, as Molly said. So thanks to everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.